In this video, I'm going to talk about how to remove the distance sensor or speed sensor from the PDK transmission installed in a 911. All the videos that I'd made in the past were just on the 981 platform, so the procedure is different. The workshops that do this work always remove the transmission from what I understand and something that we wanted to look at was to see if we could find a procedure that could remove the distance sensor easily without removing the transmission from the car and as it turns out it's actually not that hard a process. Not removing the transmission for this procedure has some distinct advantages. You don't need to drain the coolant which requires you not to have to then fill it and then bleed it later on. It takes a lot less effort, a lot less time, there's less risk involved and also the nice thing is you can have the sensors installed and connect the diagnostics and check that everything is working okay prior to even installing the rear case. The video is not going to cover all of the details, only the specifics for removal of the sensors from the 911. So it's essential that you watch the videos that I've made previously on how to do most of the work because 90% of it is exactly the same. I'll put links to the videos in the description. It's essential that you have a really good understanding of what's going on prior to tackling of this job. I personally didn't do this procedure. All these photographs that I'm going to use for this video come from a bloke who goes by the handle St. Joe, who is on Renlist and is part of our team that's developing the new distance sensor. Uh, he did a great job in working out how to do this. Uh, so great thanks to him for providing all of these images. Unlike the 981 or 987 platform, there are a number of different variations uh, of this transmission how, and how it's installed inside the car. So there is either two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive versions, and also depending on if it's a 991 or a 997, it will come either with or without the gear oil cooler. Uh, if it has got the gear oil cooler, the procedure for removing that is exactly the same as the 981, which is in the, the linked video. Here's an image of a 997 two-wheel drive version, which is where most of the photos will be taken from. Uh, this is looking rearwards. The basics of the procedure are to disconnect a few items on the transmission, disconnect the transmission mount, and then we will lower the transmission down slightly uh, so we get access to the rear casing. Uh, and then we're going to remove the rear casing in pretty much identical fashion that I did on the 981. Prior to starting, you will need to raise the car and remove all the underfloor panelling so it looks like what you see here in the photo. Pull off this black plastic clip that holds onto the coolant pipes. If you have a four-wheel drive version and you have a prop shaft or a carton shaft that runs uh, to the transmission, this will need to be removed. Here is an image of the output flange of a four-wheel drive version transmission. So you'll need to disconnect the three bolts that connect to the output flange, then push the carton shaft forward so it slides forward towards the front of the car, then move it downwards and then remove it from the car. If you have a 991, you will need to remove both exhaust tips, three screws for each, so when the transmission rotates down later on, these don't lift up and get damaged. Remove the gear oil drain plug and allow all the gear oil to drain. This is in a slightly different position compared to the 981 or 987 transmission. Also, if you have a gear oil cooler, so on the 991, this will take about 10 minutes to drain as it drains out the, the gear oil cooler. On the 997, there is this cross brace that needs to be removed. Remove these two screws. Uh, these take 65 Newton meters on install. Next, we need to remove the two battery cables that run into this housing that runs along the left-hand side of the transmission. Ensure you first go and disconnect the battery, then open up this uh, little housing and disconnect the two cables and push those to the side. Then we need to remove the two screws that hold this to the side of the transmission here, and then you can move the whole uh, plastic conjunct arrangement off to the side. Move to the other side of the transmission and pry off the park lock cable. Once you've done that, 
go up to this point here and pull it out of the clip where it holds onto the transmission. This is what it should look like once released. And here is the knob that on the park lock lever that it has come from. Now you can remove the clutch oil cooler on the right hand side. First thing you need to do is disconnect this screw here which allows the disc valve to come free. Then disconnect the electrical connector for the solenoid. Then remove the three screws that hold the cooler to the transmission casing. There's one on the top and two underneath. And then you can remove the two screws that hold the small brackets that hold the hard lines for the clutch fluid that goes from the transmission to the cooler itself. Those hard lines will just pop straight out the bottom. Beware that a lot of clutch fluid is going to come out, probably a, you know, a good couple of litres or so, so have a bucket handy. And then the cooler assembly, including all of the coolant lines and the disc valve can be moved down and to the right and out of the way. You'll notice in this photo that I've got here that the cooler has been disconnected. We found out later on that this doesn't need to happen. You can leave it connected and that stops you from needing to disconnect the coolant pipes. Cover the hard lines so you don't get any contamination inside and also disconnect the electrical plug up here prior to lowering the transmission, which we're going to do soon. If your transmission has the gear oil cooler on the left hand side, you'll need to remove that. That is done in an identical way to what I showed in the 981 procedure. To lower the transmission, you first need to support under the transmission pan. And then we're going to disconnect the mount transmission points. The mount itself consists of two brackets. There's a larger one which extends underneath the bottom of the car and another one which is a U-shape which hooks up over the top of the protrusion out the back of the transmission. A large bolt feeds through those two brackets as well as the mount bush itself which holds everything together. There are four attachment points for the larger of these two brackets. There's two of them shown here, as well as two attachment points for that U-shaped bracket. Depending on if your car is a 997 or a 991, the studs that you'll see here on the 997 will be replaced with screws. So the screws go straight up into the chassis. As well as that, the shapes of these brackets will be slightly different, but essentially the setup is the same. Additionally, on the 991, there are small diagonal struts that move forward from the larger of the transmission mount brackets, as well as another square bracket that mounts to the underside of the chassis. You will need to remove these to remove the larger of the transmission mount brackets. Here is an image of the transmission mount brackets after they've been removed. Once those mounting points on the transmission mount brackets have been disconnected, you can lower the transmission and then completely remove the brackets entirely by removing the big bolt that goes through the mount bushing. Lower the transmission enough so the engine is just about to touch the big strut that sits underneath here in between the engine and the transmission and that will give you sufficient room at the back to remove the rear casing. If you have a 991, this piece on the back of the transmission will need to be removed after you lower the transmission. So remove the two screws off the side and remove it. If you have a four wheel drive version, then you first need to remove the output flange. It's pretty simple. Leave the park lock engaged to lock the output shaft. Then just remove the big nut off the back. And then once that's done, the output flange just slides out. Depending on if you have one or two of these plugs at the back of the transmission, you'll now need to remove those. Technique for that is identical to what I describe in the 981 video. Once the plugs have been removed from the back of the transmission, then you need to remove the circlips from the shafts. This is done in an identical fashion to what I showed in the 981 video. Depending on the version of transmission that you have, this is going to be a little bit different. For the later model, two-wheel drive versions, you just have two circlips. However, for the earlier model, so 987 or 997, like on this transmission here, instead of on the lower shaft having a circlip, it has this big slotted nut, which you need to remove. If you have a four-wheel drive version transmission, there's no circlip or big nut because before, when you removed the output flange and the big nut that was holding on the back of that, that is the thing that holds the shaft in place. 
If your transmission has the slotted nut, you'll need to bend back the tabs that lock it in place. This is actually quite difficult. You probably have to be fairly aggressive with it to get a tool in there and bend these back. And it's probably the hardest part of the whole job. Once those tabs have been bent back or broken off, then you'll probably need to make up your own tool. Most have made these from probably a 36 millimeter socket and cut some pieces into it that slot into the grooves so you can remove the nut. Once the circ clips or this nut have all been removed, now you can go ahead and remove the rear casing. This is done exactly the same way as I described in the 981 video. So you need to remove all of the screws around the perimeter of the rear casing. Uh, and additionally, the single one on the side that holds onto the idler shaft for reverse. Uh, and then you use a puller tool to remove the rear casing. The 911 tool is slightly different to the 981 and 987 tool in that the position of two of the holes is slightly different. I'll put a, a diagram up of that template now, but the technique is exactly the same. The only thing that is slightly different is that if you have a four wheel drive version, you don't need one of the holes and a threaded rod to push out the lower of the two shafts because all you're going to do is rest the, the tool on it and push it out as shown in this picture. Be very careful when you are removing the rear casing not to have the pinion shaft bearing fall out and break. Make sure you watch the technique that I use in the 981 video to ensure that doesn't occur because spares are not available. Once you have the rear casing removed and it looks like this, you can go ahead and remove the distance sensor or the speed sensor as per my other 981 video and install as per the manufacturer's recommendations. Prior to installation of the rear casing, I would suggest connecting your diagnostics to check that the sensors, the new one that you just installed is working okay. Clearly before you do this, you'll need to connect the battery and before this, you'll need to reconnect those uh, positive cables uh, to each other and make sure that they are clearly insulated well from the chassis or the transmission casing so you don't have that short out. So you can do that temporarily so you can then check it and then disconnect everything prior to putting on the rear casing. Installation of the rear casing is identical to what I showed in the 981 video using the M24 or M22 bolts. For the lower of the two shafts, because of the protrusion that comes out of the bottom of this transmission, you'll need a bolt that's at least 100 millimeters long so you can get it in there and do the job. The only thing that's a little bit different about this is if you have the four wheel drive version, you will need some additional tools to pull the shaft through the bearing. What we'll be doing is pulling the shaft through the bearing that pushes the the bearing hard down onto the shaft at the lower end near the sprocket where it's an interference fit. There are two problems here. Firstly, the shroud on the rear casing surrounds everything. Uh, it would be simple enough to use the output flange and use the nut to pull it on down, but unfortunately the number of threads here, it's just not long enough to do that. So we'll need some additional tools to pull it on. You will need a number of lengths of pipe that is about 34 millimeters inside diameter and not too thick. 34 millimeters because the outside diameter of the shaft is 33 millimeters. Uh, and we don't want it too wide so it doesn't impede on the seal that's in the, the flange on the rear casing. The thread on the shaft that we're going to use the standard nut to pull the shaft through with is 12 millimeters long. The thread pitch is 1.5 millimeters and to have sufficient strength in the threads and the nut when we're pulling this on you need at least five threads which is about seven and a half millimeters which leaves us about between four and five millimeters of extra so what that means is we'll have progressively longer pieces of pipe about about four millimeters each so when we initially put the first one on we tighten it down until it bottoms out and then we're going to replace that pipe with another one that's about four millimeters longer and progressively do that until we get the thing fully seated. Once the piece of pipe has been put on, use a washer so then you can put on the nut prior to starting to turn. Also to ensure that the shaft doesn't turn as you're tightening this down, ensure that the park lock is engaged.
To get pipes of the correct length, I would suggest initially putting the rear casing on, measuring the, uh, the distance to the base of the threads that we're going to use that nut on, plus a little bit more, and then just go to a, a metal uh, shop where they just have a whole bunch of pipe and they can cut things very cheaply and easily exactly to the length so everything's perfectly square. Uh, so the cost of the pipes will be very little at all uh, and it's very easy to get exactly the tools that you're after. You don't necessarily need to use pipes until it's all the way home. As long as you get it far enough down so that you can then put on the output flange and then put on the nut and have sufficient thread so you can tighten it fully home, that's all that's required. Note that whilst we are tightening this down, we are also tightening down the bolt on the other shaft in exactly the same way as it's done on the 981 or 991 two-wheel drive version, as I've shown in the other videos. You need to progressively pull these down evenly, probably half a turn uh, at a time each, so the rear casing gets pulled on as evenly as possible. If your transmission has this slotted nut and those tabs most likely you're not going to be any good anymore. You'll need to go and find yourself the best, strongest Loctite you can get your hands on and apply that prior to installing uh, this rear nut. Installation is simply the reversal of before. A couple of things that uh, you might find that give you some difficulty, the studs that you see here and especially the one on that U-shaped transmission bracket, they might be a little bit difficult to uh, work around to get the brackets around and then slot the bracket over the top of those studs. It's pretty simple to remove the studs. They have an 8mm hex on the end of them, so you can just use an 8mm socket to remove those out of there. Lift everything up in place so you would connect the, the two uh, brackets and put that big bolt that goes through the bush all together. Have that lightly together, push everything up in place and then bolt everything down so it's connected to the chassis of the car and then you can tighten the, the large bolt that goes through the bush. Torques for all of these for the attachment points to the chassis, 65 newton meters and for the big bolt that goes through the middle of the bush is 120 newton meters. Once everything's been installed to its original position, you will need to fill the fluids again. So fill the gear oil. You can fill the clutch fluid oil until it's starting to dribble out. And then the first thing you do when you start the engine is you're going to top that up so the clutch fluid is to its uh, correct level. The correct procedure if you have a gear oil cooler is to put the car into first gear uh, and then run it for a couple of minutes. Uh, and then top it up because that will have filled the gear oil cooler. Don't do that yet because you ne need to do the calibration procedure first. So uh, you can fill up the, that last little bit in the gear oil cooler a little bit later on once the calibration has been done. So what you need to do is obviously get the clutch fluid full and then warm everything up so you can conduct the calibration procedure. I would suggest only doing the calibration without part replacement. If you do the one with part replacement, uh, that's the one that seems to give a lot of issues. And even though you may have changed the uh, one of the sensors over, uh, you don't need to complete the calibration with part replacement. That is for a like a full valve body replacement or a complete transmission replacement. Uh, so I, I would advise against doing that so you don't end up with calibration problems. And then once that is complete, then you can go and top up the gear oil.